an eighth special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. A platypus's tail comes to life. It was like a unicorn to them because it's so weird. We reveal the celebrity artist behind a big brand. It, it's great marketing ploy. I mean, why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's a great idea and, and it worked. Meet a true Renaissance man and all his creations. It's like being a detective. You keep the heat on till the steel talks. And a veteran heals through visual expression. It's incredible to see a person fly when I was in a body cast on a bed. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. We start with some grown-up story time at Boo Town, a fun, non-traditional theater in Houston, Texas. Sit down, get comfortable, and watch this shadow puppet show about an unfortunate platypus. I was watching Life of Mammals, which David Attenborough narrates, and it's really wonderful. And he came to this section that was about the platypus, but you didn't know that it was about the platypus. And he was telling a little bit about their history. And he's just so animated and so great. And he said that when explorers first discovered this animal and sent word back, nobody believed them and that they thought it was, it was like a unicorn to them because it's so weird. And then it just zoomed on David Attenborough's face and he goes, but no, it's real, it's alive, it's the platypus. And it was just really magical and I fell in love with David Attenborough and the platypus at the same time. And so yeah, that's where we came up with the idea. Uh, so he gets taken from his homeland, basically stolen for scientific research, and then he, there's some scenes where he's getting worked on in a lab, and then he gets sold to a circus uh, once they're done with him to live in a sideshow tent, and that's basically as far as I can go. I mean, what are you gonna do if you get <laughs> stolen? I mean, he, there's also, what I think is the saddest part is that there's no way for him to go home ever. He's never going home. And so he just has to figure it out and make the best of what's given to him. And at first, it's the worst that's given to him. And there's really no good to be made of it. But once he, uh, once he's sold to the circus, he can kind of start to, uh, start to adapt and figure out what he's gonna do now. I had a lot of grand ideas about things that I wanted to do with like moving parts and um, things that are really, you, you need more 3D puppets for. And at first when we were starting out, I was like, I wanna play with that. I wanna, I wanna see what that's like. And, and you have to adjust your whole set too, because it's not just a table with projectors at that point. You need to have shelves attached to your screens if you're gonna have 3D things built up onto them. And we didn't actually do any of that. And I like it that way because I think what's great about shadow puppets is, it, is they're so simple and it's just shapes and two colors and that's all you really have to communicate. I, did, I do think the moving puppets that we do have are the best that we've made so far. We've, we made a couple platypuses where his heads and his tails move and I just think it looks so cool. And I think it uh, has a greater emphasis because it's special when that happens. There's, it's not just everywhere all over the place, so. Two overhead projectors on one screen. It's pretty magical. To find out more, go to BooTown.org. Up next, we head to Cleveland, Ohio, where over a hundred years ago, General Electric was fueling a revolution. The light bulb had just been developed, offering an alternative to gas and candles. Still, getting Americans to embrace the new technology would take some convincing. And even more surprisingly, it was artist Norman Rockwell who was employed to do so. For centuries, homes were lit like this. Towards the end of the 19th century, a radical new idea emerged, the electric light bulb. Thomas Edison unveiled his version in 1879. 
Two years later, his Edison Illuminating Company began wiring Manhattan to bring electric light into homes. Now, Edison's bulb wasn't the first, but it was one of the best. GE company needed to market their new bulbs, encourage people to buy the new bulbs because they're much more efficient. The electric power companies wanted people to, ad to adapt the, and use these newer high efficient lamps. Same, we're, you know, the companies now, power companies want us to use energy efficient lamps. The Edison Illuminating Company eventually turned into General Electric and began selling light bulbs called Edison Mazda, a reference to the god of wisdom and light, Ahura Mazda. It wasn't an easy sell. There were big investments to make when new technology came along. Not only was there the idea of was it safe, there were major decisions to wire a house, put wiring in, run it from the street. Um, there, these were not probably easy decisions, and they were expensive. GE executives turned to the national media for help. At the time, print was king. This is the era before television when most news and most information was disseminated in newspapers and magazines. So the illustrators had a very, very important role in communicating uh, news, selling product through advertising, which really began to grow during this time. The Saturday Evening Post was the most influential journal in America. Enter Norman Rockwell, a high school dropout with an incredible gift. His paintings graced the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, and he quickly became a rising star in the art world. He left Mamaroneck High School in 10th grade to pursue a formal art uh, training, art school training in New York City. He was plucked right out of art school by the art editor, actually the editor-in-chief of Boys Life magazine. And so Norman Rockwell at the age of 18 landed a fantastic job and he was producing oh dozens and dozens of adventure, youth adventure stories for Boys Life magazine. He landed his first uh, really big national commission with the Saturday Evening Post in 1916. This would have been just four years after getting out of art school, completing his art training, and at the age of 22, he appeared on the cover of the most widely read journal of the day. Norman Rockwell's realistic and recognizable style made him a household name. His ability to capture a slice of Americana made Rockwell a hit with the American public and a good fit for GE. I think the appeal of Norman Rockwell to the average reader and to Americans today is that he really loved people and he took the time to see. And so Rockwell's genius, I think, was in celebrating the heroic in the ordinary and everybody could see themselves and see the expression of these emotions and these family moments in these pictures. General Electric wanted to take that and apply those values to the Edison Mazda lamp, associate Edison Mazda lamps with those same set of values. Um, it, it's a great marketing ploy. I mean, why not? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea and, and it worked. Rockwell's Edison Mazda campaign debuted in 1916. He produced the art for nearly a decade, portraying light as an essential part of the American experience. Well, the role of the illustrators in, uh, in those days was to tell America's story. It was, uh, their work was very influential, showing people what to wear, how to entertain, how to enjoy each other's company. It was a reflection of American life. These, uh, particularly the Norman Rockwell uh, scenes, are reminiscent of his covers for Saturday Evening Post. They're very uh, Americana, uh, family at home, uh, in, kind of enrobed within this, this light of the Edison Mazda lamp. The idea was to get people to uh, see these ads and to have a positive outlook on purchasing the new tungsten Mazda lamps uh, from General Electric. The campaign included approximately 20 museum quality oil paintings. Each took about four months to complete. Rockwell was meticulous with each one, using models and photography to soft sell the public. They, in a, in a sense, became a spokesperson for that company, for that product uh, in their day. All of the details used to tell a story are very carefully thought through. Each piece of clothing, each item on a table, all of these details framed the image 
and set up the composition and moved your eye around to pick up all the details so that uh, all without you being aware of it, all of this is very subtle, so that you would read the story, this visual story in the canvas or printed on the printed page. Working on a national advertising campaign brought Rockwell lots of money and popularity. But as with many artists, he struggled with giving up creative control for a paycheck. Well, there absolutely was a code amongst the illustrators. Artists uh, preferred to eschew the commercial side of their art. And they felt that this was a step down. And he took a blood oath with his fellow artists that they would never stoop to commercial art. But of course, commercial art paid better. And it put food on the table. Rockwell's relationship with GE ended in the mid-1920s. Ironically, it was new technology that brought it all to an end as radio and photography forced colossal changes in the advertising business. We see a great shift in the use of illustrators for advertising commissions when photography uh, really made inroads in the publishing world. And of course, also television, I think, was the other a uh, big reason that we begin to see magazines, especially, moving away from illustration art because they had to compete with TV. Today, seven of the original paintings done for the Edison Mazda campaign remain on the campus of the General Electric facility in the city of East Cleveland. These homespun images are reminders of the dawn of a new age when America adopted a new technology and stepped out of the darkness and into the light. And here's the children's hour. And here's a here's a this is a great one. I love this one, because here it shows probably a grandfather again with grandchildren laying on the floor. the The Edison lamp is part of the way that he's entertaining his 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 grandchildren. So it has a very positive role in this picture. What a great thing you can do! It serves not only to illuminate the whole room, but you can even turn it into an entertainment center if you want. And again, you laugh at it. It's meant to be. You get a chuckle out of it, and it's fun to look at. And again, it's that that warmness of intergenerational family and of the home being a place where one can uh, relax and and entertain your grandchildren. So, this is 1922. That's a great one. In this segment, we meet Wisconsin artist and Renaissance man Bill Reed, whose metal creatures are anything but stiff. They move, some even fly. All are testaments to Reed's artistic talent and innovative mind. Take a look. When you think about it, I'm wearing sunglasses, I'm in the dark, and I'm looking at this little flame. It's like being a detective, you keep the heat on till the steel talks, you know. It starts telling you stuff, and you listen, and it takes a lot of patience, because they make a lot of, take a lot of time to make. And just making up your own world, I think everybody wants to make up their own world. My name's Bill Reed, I'm a sculptor, and I live in Racine. I make things out of steel in general, I do painting too, and I usually paint the steel. And I like stories. I like making things. I really like that idea. So I actually started, did a little aluminum casting at the beginning and got into that whole type of thing. And then I did, went back to welding, like arc welding, big wire structures and big things. And for actually about 30 years now, I've been making things out of sheet metal, with wire cages, animals, and story-related things. I like that because you can do mechanical things with them. They can be really light, um, but they're really strong, and uh, it gives me lots of opportunities. I think the story thing gives it an extra dimension of just being a sculpture. They often start with a pun, or I, it's usually just a sketch, but it's often based on words. I think the English language is so wacky, because how can pie be something good to eat and also this really cool number? And then there's pie rats, too, making this honey badger in a, like a forest of pies, pie rats, and uh, all sorts of goofy stuff. But I usually, if I'm starting a beast, I'll start with the trunk, the, the middle part, and build out. I'll build that, then do the head, then do the legs, usually put nice shoes on them, then do the arms, kind of build out from the center out. 
because that body just determines how big the whole thing's going to be. I might want to just start with an idea. I want to make a mechanical thing. I'll just make a little vehicle thing with the movement and then figure out what kind of creature to put on it. It's fun to do different stuff, I guess. I don't want to do the same thing over and over. I'm basically working with wire, really thin, like eighth inch usually, and sheet steel, 24 gauge steel. And I usually make a wire structure, usually with a silhouette, like if I'm doing a fish, I'll do the silhouette of the fishy and then fill it in with the wire and then lay it on the sheet steel, draw the patterns, cut it out. And I use an oxyacetylene torch. It's seriously hot, but it's a really tiny little flame. And uh, the nice thing is it's just steel to steel. I don't need flux or anything. It's just steel, and the steel wants to melt together. Steel is very friendly. When they're ready to paint, what I'll do is I'll run the torch over it and knock off any scale. And then I bang it, actually, to really knock off any other, anything else that's loose. And then I put a good primer on it to protect it from rusting. And then I actually use like hardware store water-based enamel paints. And they're nice, they don't have fumes, and you can really play with them almost like watercolor. You can do lots of layers. Kids ask me how many I've done. I, I've, I must have done at least 4,000 sculptures, you know? Because I've been doing over 100 a year for 35 years or something. It adds up. The last year or so, I've been doing bunions and Hawaiians. If you had an onion suit on, you'd be crying, right? So these are Hawaiian onions dressed up in bunnies, bunnies or looking like bunnies and selling their tears on the street or carving up rainbows or you know trying to make a living somehow or another. So that's one of my favorite things of the last year. I did a big owl, like a really six foot tall owl. He's got a big flamingo uh, flying over the top of his head and there's a crank and the flamingo's wings go up and down. Also, I did another one with, with owls again, a little one, and it's um, three owls, like they're migrating. So you turn the crank and they're all going through, but their wings flap up and down. The bee bomb was the most ambitious thing. The car is a legit road car. It was built on a 1988 Ford Escort, and it doesn't look anything like it, but it is certified to drive. That was probably my most ambitious project ever, just because I didn't mess anything up mechanically with it. The pedal cars are fun because they're bicycles. I love bicycles. They're simple, they're easy to fix, and they're fairly efficient. The first one I made, the Reedster, we actually made the frame. I had a help from an engineer friend, but we made it from the frame up, total, even the frames made by hand and the kingpins and all that. And they use wheelbarrow tires, and I made a, it's a little anteater and it goes along really nice. And then there's Moby, like a Moby Dick, the, way, the great, great white whale. Just trying to scare you. I like do something different. And there's something really goofy when you see these things moving through space instead of just a static, another static sculpture or monument. To see them moving through the sky, through the air, is really, it's just a whole another dimension to me. I think it's funny. I get a lot of, you must have a lot of time on your hands, but many people get a, I think they get a smile out of them. It's kind of a different language. I try to learn from the things, you know, what, what I think works in my mind. And the idea of finding things, a new story, new character, just, you know, I mean, it's great to be alive and doing stuff fun like this, and I'm lucky. To learn more about Bill Reed's art, visit his website, bbomb.com. Finally, we meet a war veteran who found healing through the arts. Not only was he able to combat old demons, but also he was able to express himself like never before. Here's his story. I'm a retired Marine Corps. Um, I was wounded in Vietnam. I've been retired since 1970. I have wax here to keep my hands from crippling up because the tendons will stretch and the hand will become unusable. But I'll take this and by the end of the day, this will become something. 
I see things in everything. I like to see people. I watch people. I wonder how they would look in bronze and or marble or wood or whatever. I am a volunteer teacher at Maitland Art Center. I'm a volunteer at uh, Orlando Museum of Art. I, I do this almost every month on the first Thursday events. For Maitland, I teach and do demonstrations there uh, on the second Friday of each month. Nothing is new in art. Right? <laughs> I was uh, wounded three times. The first time was in hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, and I didn't even know I was wounded. And the second time was in close combat by a grenade, but I wasn't severely wounded either. The third time was in mine. It was a sack of clothes. I picked it up and it exploded, and that took me out of the war. I couldn't talk about the war. And then when I did, they had no idea what I was talking about. Finally, I was talking to a doctor, had no clue about war, he was talking about toilet training and was I close to my mother, things that were stupid. So I got so angry with him, I drew him a pictures of what I was seeing, of what I was remembering, what I would see every time I closed my eyes. And it was very powerful. I saw um, a dance on public television, this is in 1970, a woman in leotards, young, small, took a leap across the stage, the dance floor, and I felt, um, I can't describe how I felt, it was incredible to see a person fly when I was in a body cast on a bed. The image was imprinted in my brain. From that moment on, I just was enamored with dance and, and the human form as never before. Damage from the war lasts forever. And the beauty of dance is gone the moment it's done. So what I'm doing is I'm, what these women work all their lives for, put it in bronze so it's frozen in time. Their expression, their work from three years old to, to 50, is, is memorialized. It is put into a monument to what they did. So the art, the sculpting, sketches, the paintings were so powerful and it was a language, even though I'm a college educated person speaking English to English speaking doctors, they didn't understand. But the art transcended all languages, all ages, they all knew what it was and they wanted to discuss it now. That's where the art comes in. It's the bridge and what happened in the rest of the world. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.